Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our second Wasani to Najisot webinar, which will focus on digital distribution and monetization. My name is Judy Ogana. I'm with the UNESCO Culture Program at the Regional Office for Eastern Africa. And I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the organizers of this program um, and this series. Uh, the series is spearheaded by the Creative Economy Working Group, Alliance Francaise, the Godan Arts Center, Toweza Communications, and UNESCO, in partnership with the Ministry of Sports, Culture, and Heritage, and the Kenyan National Commission for UNESCO. This Wasani to Najisot webinar today is the second of this series, following the first one held in October on copyright in Kenya, with copyright experts Liz Lenjo and Catherine Mujomba. If you haven't already, I'd encourage you to look it up look up the discussion at the Alliance for Say YouTube web pages. This series of talks are as a result of recommendations made through the Resilient Kenya discussions that were held in May, June, and July this year, which aimed to enable strategic reflection, consolidation of thoughts and ideas on the impact of COVID-19 on the creative economy sector while charting a way forward towards the, the sector's resilience. One of the recommendations was to enhance learning for practitioners in the creative sector and to contribute to continuous development and knowledge sharing among and between creatives for practical insights and exchanges. 
So this webinar will be the last one that we will host this year, but we'll be sure to communicate to you on the themes and the dates of the next one early next year in 2021. So let me first um, also take an opportunity to thank Abdi Gero and the Chalbi Desert Groove from Masabit for the music you were just listening to in the beginning of this webinar. And Angi Shuki for the painting displayed here, as well as the poster for this event. We also want to thank all the attendees who have logged into this conversation so far today, and the ones who will of course join um, later on and also on YouTube later. So without much further ado, allow me to introduce Angela Washuka, who will be a very distinguished moderator for this discussion today, and will also introduce our expert panelists. Angela Washuka is co-founder of BookBank, which is an organization driving restoration and programming for some of Nairobi's most iconic public libraries. She is a founding member of the Creative Economy Working Group and was previously an arts management fellow at the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Washuka is a 2019-2020 Africa leader at the Obama Foundation and is publisher at Bank Books. So without further delay, I'd like to welcome Washuka to introduce our panelists and lead us through this conversation today. Karibu sana Washuka. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Judy. Yeah. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction, Judy. Um, and thank you to you all who are joining us from wherever you may be. Um, I know that you're super, super keen to listen to what our panelists have to say today. I'm excited to be speaking to all of them. So I would like to jump right in. So this afternoon, we'll be speaking with Wilfred Kiyomi, Patricia Kihoro, and George Gashui, who's also known as Poji. I'm not sure what his Mpesa name is, but <laughs> one amongst those two is the real one. Um, and we will start with Wilfred. Um, Wilfred is the founding director of African Digital Media Group, ADMG, which is actually made up of three entities. There's an institute, there's a foundation, and there are also studios. He has over 20 years experience in the East African film and television industry and currently runs um, ADMS, so the studios, where he, he heads up sales, distribution, marketing, and production at a company that's really dedicated to exporting African content to a global audience from the London office. So the studios have recently launched boomicentral.com, which is a vendor-driven multimedia platform serving clients in Africa and the diaspora. And so we'll be talking to Wilfred quite a lot about that particular Boomi Central angle and how it relates to our conversation today about distribution and monetization. He also holds a master's in film distribution and marketing from Birmingham City University in the UK. Karibu sana Wilfred. We will then be speaking with Patricia Kihoro. We'll be talking about content distribution, monetization, paid partnerships, and influencer marketing. I doubt many of you actually need me to make an introduction to Patricia. She's a very well-known figure on our internet, especially. So she's a Kenyan singer. She's also an actress. She's a radio presenter. She's an event host. She's a moderator, a digital content curator, and also an improv comedian. And I have seen this who loves coffee, travel, music, performance, working out daily, riding around Nairobi on her scooter, and most of all, laughter. So what she mostly shares about online is her life and all the things she encounters as she journeys through. And that includes the brands that she interacts with on her day-to-day -day basis. And she also loves to celebrate African brands, <clears throat> innovators, art and culture, and with a very kind of strong bias towards music. So if you look at her social media platform, she's showcasing her singing, her acting, photography, people, travel, festivals, being on stage entertaining and making people laugh until everyone collapses in happy tears. She aims to have her audiences leave her platforms in good spirits and with positive energy having learned something new. Karibu sana Patricia and we're really looking forward to talking to you. And finally, our third panelist is Poji, George Kashui who works in music distribution and monetization, and we'll be talking about that. He's a creative entrepreneur. He's trained in finance and information systems, which he couples with a wealth of marketing experience within the African continent, and a key passion to secure and grow a valuable future for the youth of the region. He has over 12 years experience in events and entertainment with recognition and an award in event management from Diageo Marketing. 
in 2011 and also specializing in talent, specifically artists and DJ management and entertainment um, marketing in the region. He's also the co-founder of MOOC Africa, which is a social commerce platform that I know a lot of us have used um, that is growing the creative economy in East Africa. It was launched in Kenya five years ago and now serves 2,000 small to medium merchants across three markets, and that's in Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda. And these tend to be musicians, event organizers, and content creators who are mostly based between um, age, rather, between 18 and 35, and who use the platform to monetize their very lucrative craft, which is evidenced through the over a million dollars in transactions that they transact every year. Karibuni Sana. Welcome, Koji. So we have a very distinguished panel this afternoon, and I know that the topic is monetization and distribution. And that's something that a lot of our audiences will really be looking to dig into your own personal experiences and what you're doing in terms of the platforms that you're working with and working for. And I'd like to dig right in. The order that we're going to do it in is we'll have a discussion first with Wilfred, and that will be followed by one with Patricia, and then finally, with Poji. So Wilfred, we want to dig right in, um, find out as much as we can, by you giving us an overview of Vumi Central, which is very, very new and fresh, and also the Africa Digital Media Group and the kind of work that you do there that relates to the topic that we're discussing, which is distribution and monetizing. Great, thank you, um, Ashuka, for that intro. Um, just quickly, I mean, in terms of um, our you know, our thought and why we wanted to launch this platform is that we've been involved with, you know, training for the last nine years. I've been in the industry for um, about 20 years plus. So for me and every other filmmaker or content creator, the issues were always about how do we monetize um, the content that they create? Everyone is very passionate, but then how do they get the, you know, um, the back back? Um, and how do they connect with customers? So, so after you know, um, after deliberating for a while, I really wanted to get into this sector, and I, I, I took off and um, to exactly learn how to um, do that or distribute because I think it's a very you know it's a it's a black hole, and no one was willing to teach um, or you know um, give the secrets to the trade. Mm -hmm. But then again, moving forward is that um, after going through the training, it was very clear that the model that um, the rest of the world uses might not work um, in, in our region because it's very, um, so if it's movies, it's very theoretically driven in terms of the numbers, box office, yeah? So how do we, you know, monetize with box office when we don't have cinema? So the, mm -hmm. the, the, the trick was, okay, we have to think about a solution that um, can be easily accessible on mobile, but also secure enough for people to trust and you know, for content creators to be able to trust and use it um, regularly as vendors. So we, what we did is that we created a platform that is a vendor driven platform. Uh, it's not only a, a film you know, or video platform. So it actually has four different hubs Vumi is a Swahili word, um, which means, you know, uh, word on the street or what, you know, the rumor. Um, so Vumi is, a, is basically an entertainment platform, mm -hmm. which will carry the best of the best of world cinema, television, um, music, books, um, even gaming um, with an emphasis to African content. So currently we've launched the, one of the hubs, which is now Watch. So you'll find the link as watch.vumicentral.com. And this will host uh, movies, TV, TV content, um, kids content. Uh, currently, we're even able to do uh, monetization of live streams. So you okay. can actually buy a ticket. So let's say a boxing match was happening somewhere, a football match. We can actually monetize that um, single event um, through the platform. And so we just launched in um, July. Um, we had big plans. We wanted to launch very early during Kalasha in around March. So we did a soft launch in uh, Balinale. Unfortunately, um, COVID hit and we had to you know, move everything and of course now do a very gradual launch. So we've gradually been onboarding content. Now we have about 20, 20 movies, um, a TV series, um, and you know, some uh, one 
animation kids content. So we wanted to see how the platform works. And you know, for a while now we've been testing that and I, I think we are very confident that you know, if it's a TV series, you're able to watch all the episodes without uh, any hitch. So that, that works fine. The way it works that is that it's um, um, uh, vendor driven. So you as a content creator decide the length or you know, the length that you want to host the, 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 the film or the TV show that on a platform. Mm-hmm. And it's completely non-exclusive. So you can have it, your, you can have your content on other platforms as well. But what we did is that we have three tires. So we have uh, what we call t- a transactional uh, BOD. Um, we have okay. adverti- uh, advertising driven or AVOD. And then we have um, subscription. So we haven't launched subscription yet, but we are currently um, uh, testing out the AVOD which um, the way it works out is just like YouTube, the ads come automatically um, and, and they are um, geared, I mean, they are targeted to whoever is watching. So you, the ad that you watch is not the same as um, I would watch. So it's, it, and it all you know, uses technology. Um, but the one thing that is very um, primary to the platform is that we've made sure that we're using what we call a DRM, um, which is a, like a digital rights management which makes sure that your content is free of piracy. You mm-hmm. can download that film, you can, it's completely scrambled, you cannot watch it on any, anywhere else. So um, as I said, we now on the, under TiVo, we have um, premium, which is, you know, basically means that you can rent a, a film or uh, buy a film to watch on the platform. You cannot watch it um, outside of the platform. We have mm-hmm. bigger plans to you know, roll out um, um, the native apps, uh, but for now we are we are we are only on the web. But we should be launching what we call um, a progressive web app, which means you don't have to download an app. It actually you know looks like an app on your phone on the home screen, but it's not a, an app. And once you click, you go directly to the, app, the platform, and it will operate like an app. So that will be launching um, sometime later this month. So if I get this correctly, Wilfred, and congratulations um, for launching in a year that's been very difficult yeah. um, for most people and also in terms of just movement of content, figuring new models out. Um, so it's very good um, that you guys have been able to do this and test it over the past few months. Now, if I'm a content producer, let's say I'm a filmmaker, um, what you're essentially saying is that I post my content on your platform and have various ways in which I can monetize this. Is that correct? Correct. So, for, uh, right now, um, the premium window is you know, is is, is, um, is operational, and uh, we have a few you know movies that we are actually renting out on the platform. So you rent out, you pay um, through M-Pesa or uh, a Visa card, and um, the other thing is also not just a Kenyan platform. It's actually available across Africa. The payment gateway we are using allows you to pay to to receive. Um, payment in over 19 countries across Africa. So, you know, someone in Nigeria can watch your film. Um, actually, what's really holding us back is, you know, um, marketing uh, and, and pushing, you know, in terms of that. Other is it works as it should. So, if any, if you have a short film, we have a few short films already, um, mm-hmm. and they've been doing, you know, quite well. And so, and you decide the pricing. We can guide you in terms of the pricing. But mm-hmm. then you decide how much you want to charge for your work. And we really, you know, we can work on a marketing campaign together, um, like in terms of pushing, because we also believe that um, it's not enough to publish your work online without right. any noise making. Because, you know, we know like Netflix, there were movies that were on Netflix more than two years ago, but people yes. never knew them, uh, never knew about them. So it's right. really about marketing. How much noise are you able to make? about that, um, the content that you put out there, yeah. The other thing that I find really interesting about your model, Wilfred, is of course, there's a lot of experience that Vumi Central is carrying over from having taught these skills. Um, you know, there are all these creative courses at ADMI that have been offered for some time now. And there's been a big conversation in the creative sector about <laughs> where do you go to get certified skills? Yeah. Um, that are transferable to like everyday work in the creative sector. So for a long time, there was always Mm. this feeling of you kind of learn on the job, right? And obviously having been someone who set up an institute like that, that has three different arms, this is with African digital media, um, what, what compelled 
you, what, what, what were you seeing in the market that compelled you that Bumi Central is something that is necessary? What are you seeing in terms of film distribution in the region, um, in terms of audiences, in terms of platforms, yeah. in terms of content, and even the, the potential market size? So, so I think the one thing that people need to realize is that Kenya is a very small market. Um, you know, you don't have more than 200,000 people who come to your cinema. Uh, but then when you make it available like on mobile, then now you are, you are able to access more than um, 10 million people you know, um, um, who are able to access. Um, you know, Safaricom currently has about more than 20 million subscribers. Half of that, half of those people use smartphones. So it's really, you know, getting to a point where we are now able to partner with um, such a such a, um, 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 a base, a customer base, and your content, you know, uh, grows. And you can do that across Africa. Then you now can see we are able to get to a billion people easily. But if we do um, the traditional way, where you're thinking, you know, uh, we can only distribute through. Um, theater, um, then you're reaching a very small um, target audience. But then in in, even in terms of uh, when, you, um, when you're creating the content, even globally, even in the US, uh, where, which is the biggest um, market for film, you, they find that um, when you make a film, domestically doesn't sell as much as when you now open it up to the other international markets. So mm -hmm. it's really important for you to understand Yes, I'm making a film about Kenya, you know, about a Kenyan character set in Kenya. The language is local because, you know, you want your performers, you know, as comfortable as possible. And, and then now, you know, you, you make sure that your um, production values are as good as any other international content so that they can pair up with each other. And once you tick those boxes, it's very easy for your content to get onto Amazon, Netflix, and we've seen it. Um, uh, recently. So it's very easy. For, all you need to do is um, get to those levels. But then it doesn't have to mean that you have to make your film in English. No. We've been watching you know, movies in Spanish and Russian and whatever. So it, it's really um, important for people to understand the market that they want to reach out to and how far they want the movie to, tra uh, to travel. That tells you how to position your film from the script stage. Yeah. And also in terms of genre and you know, even the language, um, the quality that you want to shoot on, that you know, directly now relates also to your budget and um, the elements that you want in your story. So once you start, under, the, so people need to first do their research first, yes. decide where they want to position their film. Even, um, uh, and I always say the easiest way is to do comparable films. You go on to IMDb, um, look at comparable films that you want, you compare your story or film and look and you know start to look at how far they were able to sell in terms of markets. Then from there work backwards mm -hmm. and, and say this is what I want to achieve. So how can I get to that level? Then now you know you know your film. If it doesn't sell in, in locally domestically, then you're able to also export it as well internationally. Thank you, Wilfred. And I know you had mentioned um, just previously um, that a kind of area that you're still working on is, yeah. is marketing. And there's actually a question from the floor on our chat here from Joe Mboya asking if you could share some strategies um, that you're considering for marketing. Okay, so for marketing, um, usually what you, what you do is that you start um, from doing a marketing report. You know, you have a film or uh, a marketing strategy. You decide, okay, this is um, the film that I have. Be honest enough to do um, what we call like a SWOT analysis. What are the strengths of the films? What are the weaknesses? Um, what are the opportunities that you see? Um, once you do that, you start to identify which they are, where the audiences are, how do you reach them? Now, which channels do you use? Um, you know, do you use social? Do you um, decide to distribute your film in social halls across the country? So once you do that analysis, then you're able now to say, um, this is, you know, these are my weaknesses, but then how can I use that to my advantage and, and turn them into opportunities. And then of course, you, you need to think about what you call own media. Own media is um, where you start creating your own uh, from day one, from development stage, you know, BTS, photos, um, storytelling about your film, uh, because that will also come very handy when you're trying now to market that film. 
Then, you, of course, you need uh, a bot media uh, where you buy some slots, you know, um, if you can afford a you know, newspaper, TV, uh, TV advertising, but the one area that you Oh, I think we may have lost Wilfred. Seems to be a little connection hitch going on there. Um, we'll jump back into the conversation with Wilfred as soon as he's back on. But in the meantime, if you do have questions for Wilfred to do with Vumi and to do with um, film distribution, please make sure that you're sharing those on the chat box, um, wherever you're watching from. So you can comment if you're on YouTube and of course, if you're on this call itself, um, just post your question on the chat and we'll pick up the conversation with Wilfred when we can. I see that he's back on. Ah, Habari. Hi, so, sorry, I think we got lost somewhere. My no worries about that. The okay. internet gremlins did their thing. <laughs> yeah. So we were, I think we we're still on the conversation about marketing and strategies. Yes. So, um, you, you, you need to think about uh, owned media, um, you know, uh, and media where you, you, know, you, do, you do a lot of PR, publicity. Um, you, the best thing actually is uh, to talk to like a publicist who is able to get you, or a PR company, um, who, or, or a PR mm -hmm. specialist, who is able to position your story along, you know, on different media stations, um, think about radio, all the channels. One, I think once you do the sort analysis, you're now able to think backwards and say, okay, this is where the audiences are. They, you know, they're at Capital FM, they're at uh, Kiss FM. Who do I know there? Is there a, a PR guy who can position me, you know, to do like a talk there or whatever? So you, those are earned media. Um, owned media is where you now do your own interviews that you publish on your YouTube channel. Um, social, social media as well. And then of course you can now do, um, you can now be, buy some media as well on, um, um, on, on, on social media platforms like Twitter, Facebook. Um, so that way you're also able to, to give it a push. The whole okay. idea is to create what we call uh, uh, a form of yeah? fear of missing out. There's this movie, Softy is loud, is of how they are pushing it. Yeah. It makes you yes. feel like you want to go and watch Softy. Yeah. Yes. And by the way, it's coming on to Vomi uh, this month. Yeah. So those who missed out in the theaters are also able to catch it on digital. That's actually that segues into my next question, which is coming in from the floor, which was specifically are there any plans to get Softy on the platform? But I will also expand <laughs> that question to include yeah. what sort of new narratives are you seeing people? Um, demanding or hungering for? Are we wanting to see more fiction and feature films? Are we wanting to see more documentaries? Are we wanting to see more kids content? So in your experience since July with your platform, what sort of content would you say, also based on this question about <laughs> when you're putting soft tea on, um, what's, what's really yeah. capturing those interests? People want to see content that they relate to. Um, so, in the Kenyan audience, you know, uh, a very good or a very easy way of understanding the Kenyan audience is visiting one of the exhibitors or cinema exhibitors. Just having a casual conversation with them, they will tell you that action films, uh, comedy, action, action comedy and adventure films do the best in Kenya mm -hmm. or in the region actually. So anytime you have, and that, that tells you, you've seen the rave around uh, 46. Yeah. And if they actually had mm -hmm. taken it to a theatrical fast, when, when you could have Kenya seen the same. To the Netflix world. Yes. Exactly. But if they had also taken advantage of um, theatrical, it actually fits in very well with the, the, you know, the, the Kenyan audience in terms of their, um, their likes, right? Because even platforms, even Netflix or any other platform, they want content that is valuable. Valuable that the audience wants to watch it. 
So if you had, the, you know, um, Softing has been running on in the theaters for quite a while. Unfortunately, someone in Lodwa, Nakuru, is not able to watch it because it's not a, they don't have a cinema there. And, and because uh, we only have, what, about 50 cinemas around the country. So it's impossible for them to be able to. But then they have that urge and need to watch it. Oh, we have a time freeze again, I'm afraid. Okay, well, as you had. So yeah. it, it's really about um, the best opportunities and the best windows that you can come. Oh, no, sorry. No, there you are. Now we have you back. Sorry, sorry. maybe I should change locations. <laughs> <laughs> no, go on, please. Yeah, so I was saying it's really about understanding the audience, um, but also even as you, you know, make that film, um, knowing that, you know, do you want to attract the local audience or an international audience? And if it's an international, they probably might not be very interested in action film from Africa, to be honest, yeah? So they're looking for art house type of films. They want to escape, like Europe right now is, uh, you know, the rest of the world is going through winter. So they don't come out of the houses, they don't travel, they don't, you know, um, they don't, um, have a lot of uh, um, outdoor activities. So they want to actually escape. So the movie they want, you know, in terms of how you shoot it, they actually want to experience a different culture. Those are the kind of films that will sell internationally. Okay, okay. Thank you for those insights, um, Wilfred. Action, comedy, adventure films. I did not know that. For local audiences, for local yeah. audiences. audiences. Um, yeah. The other day I was looking at some statistics about Softee and its audience figures. Um, I think it was in about maybe a three week span. And it was very encouraging to see that so many people were going out and it mm. does show that there's definitely a hunger for content also from home. Content from elsewhere. Yeah, and also, also Softee helped, what, what helped Softee is that it also did a, a festival run first before coming into the theater. So, you know, the more awards you win, the more people want to see. Like, when you see those, um, you know, golden... On, on, on your poster or your movie, you accept that you... Um, so how valuable your content is. So you start that, crafting that strategy very early on. If you think the movie will do... The um, festival circuit first, then bring do that. Of course, it means holding. Um, you you have a time where you're not making anything um, from the movie because it's doing festival, runs, but mm. it's winning awards that will be um, other places. No matter what. Okay. Okay. Asante Sana, Wilfred. We will come back because I'm sure there are also a number of questions from the floor. Cool. Thank you so much for sharing your insights about especially your new platform. I want to switch gears now um, and invite Patricia Kihoro to come and talk to us about her world and her work. Hi, Patricia. Hello. Haribu tena. Asante sana, ni meshkuru sana. How is it going? It's going well. Uh, today was a bit of a hectic day because I just launched a brand and we were doing our PR drops. So I've been all over Nairobi dropping them off um, and I got back just in time for this. So I'm very excited to be here. I'm very grateful. Thank you for making the time. Were you doing that on your scooter? Hey, wow. Hey, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, I wish, but I had like a bunch of boxes. So these are our PR boxes and mm -hmm. uh, we had like bottles of wine in them and some chutneys and things. So lots of glass products and they wouldn't have fit on the scooter so Next so time. speaking of deliveries and mm -hmm. launching brands and new initiatives mm -hmm. um my first question for you patricia is about the ecology of the work the world that you exist in where you do your work mm -hmm. um you have so much experience of working with brands and you know being an influencer also for mm -hmm. some brands doing some influencer marketing could you talk to us please about what the ecology of your work looks like um, and in relation of course to the conversation that we're having about distribution and monetizing. Right so I think if if I even just go back to how I got into this thing and how everything then connects mm. I came onto the platforms because I'm an early adopter. When Instagram launched I was on it. 
when Facebook launched, I was on it. Even before that, when High Five launched, I was on it. MySpace, I was on it. Tumblr, I was on it. I'm the kind of person who, at a certain time in my life, I just felt like these platforms were so exciting because you got to connect with people from all over the world. Some strangers, some people that you knew, but it was a good way to sort of connect and share whatever you were going through. And so over the years in sharing some of my work, some of my life, some of my family and friends, the numbers grew and it sort of became interconnected with the work that I do. So as an actress, when I'm on set or when I'm shooting a film or talking about something that you can watch, you know, sharing that on my platforms was very interesting for people to see. If I'm performing at a concert and I had somebody record the performances and then I upload them onto YouTube, they kind of just interconnected because you know, people watching your performances on YouTube will then translate into people coming for your gigs the next time because they get to see right. what they missed if they didn't show up. And at the time, I even remember um, the first three videos I uploaded on my YouTube channel were performances at an event that was hosted by the radio station that I was working at. So it kind of all just interconnected and it became a very seamless way to sort of share and promote the things that I was doing. So it wasn't a, a mm. hard, it wasn't a hard connection to make, you know? And I think the first time I was approached to, to be paid for endorsing a brand on my platforms was back in 2014, I think, when Talia and I used to do this thing called Video Chronicles every Friday. That was <laughs> um, six years ago. Yes, yes. Um, every Friday there was, um, at noon, we would do a bulletin of lifestyle news because at the time I was a news anchor um, at Homeboys Radio. And for the entertainment news, it was a lot more fun. The music was playing. I would get into the studio maybe five minutes to time and we would dance to whatever was playing. And mm -hmm. one day somebody decided to record us dancing and Talia posted it on her Instagram page. And then it became a thing because people really enjoyed it. And every Friday they knew to expect Patricia and Talia or Panye and Tanye dancing to new music, <laughs> something exciting. So it even became, I remember somebody reached out and asked if we could talk about a detergent as we were dancing because of a song whose lyrics we had kind of flipped and used right. their, their brand name in the, in the song. Um, we didn't do it because we felt like the rate was too low at the time, even though we didn't even know what the rates were, but we were like, okay, if they've offered this, let's ask for double. We see if they'll say yes. And they didn't, but it, it was fine. Mm. But then after that, I remember then being reached out to by a bank, a banking institution that at the time wanted me to talk about my relationship with money on my blog. I used to have a blog called patriciakihoro.com and they wanted me to speak about my relationship with money and saving for six months. So every month they just wanted a blog and a tweet promoting the blog post and a Facebook post also talking about the blog post. And for that, that was my first paid campaign for six months and they paid, if I remember correctly, either, I think they paid $5,000 for that. Wow. And for for a first like influencer campaign for me i was just like bruh i could right. I, I could do this this is something I, I could i could i mean they just needed me to be completely myself and talk about saving and my relationship with money and it was really exciting it's something that i really enjoyed doing as well because i really loved writing um at the time and from then on i guess you know people will come that they're attracted to the content so they kind of just congregate around the platforms and brands notice the numbers growing and so brands start to reach out because of that and while there's some people who come onto these platforms specifically to work with brands and collaborate in creating content mm. i'm the kind of person who was on these platforms just sharing about my life and organically just showing a side of a few sides of me and brands noticed that and asked to work with me. So over the years, it's then grown into something that, you know, my social media platform still remains a place where I go to express myself. Every once in a while, I will speak about brands that are within my lifestyle. And 
I will get paid for that, but it's something that it has to be a consistent use of a particular brand and something that's sustainable so that even when a campaign is over, I'm still talking about a brand months later because it's a realistic thing that I'm doing. Yeah. It feels like a very kind of organic tie, Patricia, between anything that you're doing in your life anyway. You know, I like reading this book, so I'll post about this book. Or I like doing activity X, Y, Z, so I'll post about this. Yeah. And then um, from there, you grow an audience of people that, you know, want to keep seeing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So you say 2014 was the first time that you, you were approached for a campaign. And the figure that you just gave for the subsequent one, um, which works out to roughly just over half a million shillings over a six month period. When does that monetization spark happen for you? When does it become like, oh my goodness, actually this is something I could earn a decent living from? I think it, it actually, so the reason I got that gig is because I signed on to a platform called Webfluential mm -hmm. and it was like a, it's like Tinder for brands and influencers. <laughs> so you, as an influencer, you go and create your profile, um, put up your pictures, talk about the things that you speak about, and then brands do the same. And then, you know, when brands are looking for influencers for campaigns, they sort of just swipe through and look at people's profiles and vice versa. As an influencer, you can also swipe through brands and reach out to them if you want to work with them. So this was back in 2014. It must, no, 2014 is when we were doing the dancing. 2015 is when Barclays, the banking institution reached out. And it, it was through this webfluential platform that I got the gig because basically what would happen is that somebody would go through, they see somebody that they like, and then they reach out and they say, right. hey, you listed for a campaign. And that's when I think the spark happened. Like I'm joining this platform because it looks like this is something I could do because it's something I Joy, I'm doing it anyway. I might as well see if I can get paid for it. Um, so that's when that happened, 2015. Okay. And based off of Webfluential, I've gotten a few campaigns with some really big brands. Um, I think I've done maybe five or six campaigns just off of Webfluential um, because as with time, they also progressed to being very seamless. There's no need to you know, exchange, exchange emails or anything. It's, they're speaking to you through their chat box on the app and they just say this is what we need if you have any questions in the middle of a campaign you can quickly chat your person your you know the liaison um from webfluential yeah. and it was pretty good and there you, it you, put like your a... rate. you put your <laughs> rates you say i charge this for instagram i charge this for facebook if you're not sure they tell you people with your with the same kind of influence are charging this much right and that, guys, so it's so, like a, a tinder for campaign marketing i love it Exactly. <laughs> which yep. kind of segues actually into my next question, which is for anyone who is curious um, about getting into the kind of work that Patricia is doing, I suppose that would be a really good place to kind of start, check out with Webfluential and see how people market themselves and how you could do the same. Yep. Um, so far, Patricia, I've followed so many campaigns that you've done. Um, one of my favorite ones recently was the one about um, breast cancer month. Mm -hmm. and creating awareness around this. What have been some of your favorite campaigns that you've worked on so far? My favorite campaigns are the ones that just allow me to be myself because I can be a bit of a goofball. And um, <laughs> as a goofball, it means that some of my ideas are not necessarily conventional. They're just allowing me to run around and be my silly self. So uh, working with a brand like Showmax, for instance, is really fun because they kind of just, you know, they, there's no brief about you have to do this or you have to say this. They just tell you this month, this is the new content we're introducing and go ham, do your thing. Mm -hmm. So Showmax was really amazing. It's, it's a really amazing brand to work with and they're also long-term partners. So they're the kind of brand that I've been working with for over a year now. And you know, they also are really great in terms of respecting when I need to take a break from creating content. They're very understanding. If they see that I'm struggling, they'll always reach out and be like, is there a way we can help? What are you struggling with? How can we support you? So Showmax has been really amazing in terms of that. I really enjoyed working with Moko as well um, because it was fun to just goof around and make funny content that mm. you know, allows me to just to, to allow my ideas to flourish, you know, because my mind sometimes just does some really 
funny things. <laughs> so, as we all do. So, so that sounds like a really kind of um, great partner to work with. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess the flip side of it is you must have had experiences that are not so great. Mm -hmm. And there's a question here from Sakwa Combo, mm -hmm. who says, what campaigns haven't gone well for you? And what did you learn from those experiences? Or maybe just give us one example. Mm, for campaigns that haven't gone well, I mean, I, first of all, I just want to say that from the outside looking in, I realize that it must look like it's very fun and easy. And I get people really speaking about the content that I create and saying that when it comes to influencer marketing that I'm really great, but I don't feel like I'm a great influencer because a lot of times I think the things I struggle with are things like procrastination and dealing with um, ah, like really struggling. Sometimes a creative block will come up and I'm not the kind of person who will be able to give you a content strategy for a campaign period because I may not know what content will come to me or what idea will come to me in two weeks, for instance. And mm -hmm. so the experiences that haven't been so great are those where I felt like the brand didn't really understand how I work. And so the things that they demanded of me in terms of KPIs and dates when you're going to post was so rigid and there was no room for, oh, sorry, you know, I wasn't feeling up to it this week just because I'm going through this, but can I post next week? It's why haven't you posted? And the feedback that they're giving as well was not very specific. So if they don't like a particular piece of content, instead of saying, oh, we would like it or we would prefer if you did this, it was just feedback that's like, I don't know, I'm just not feeling the energy. Not this feeling felt it. Feeling the content. I don't know, I don't know, I'm just, just do something different. And, mm. you know, the feedback that will, get, because when I create the content, I think it's great. You know, like, I'm like, this is, this is, you know, it's, I'm talking about your brand. And I'm, I'm saying what needs to be said and you know, I'm going to lead people to, to, to buy your product. So when you say you don't know what it is, but just change it, it doesn't really help. And it then made me start to second guess the work that I was doing. Um, I wouldn't mm. say the brands themselves because I don't think the problem is the brand, maybe just the person running the account or the person tasked with dealing with the influencer who doesn't know how to engage with an influencer or content creator in a way that allows them to still be creatively, you know, free and challenged and excited about the content. Because sometimes with people like that, you find that content then is just generated to meet KPIs. Like you just yes. do it because you have to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And those are not the kinds of campaigns that I like. I want to go. No, I was going to ask you about that because there seem there does seem to be some kind of tension that emerges at some point between the kind of art of, of the content creation and yeah. I suppose what you're calling the KPIs. Mm. And related to that, if I'm someone who's like, hmm, this is something I could do. I feel like this is this is a gig I could get into. What tips would you give to like entry level someone? I think, so for entry level at the moment, one of the things that um, a lot of people think makes an influencer is high numbers in terms of followers, but there's so many different scopes of content creators. There's the micro, there's the nano influencers with, you know, not more than 5,000 followers. There's the micro, there's the, um, there's the mid, influencers i've forgotten the name for them and then there's the macro yeah. <laughs> and you know there's the mega influencers with the millions of followers so this space for everyone and i think a lot of times brands are looking to see who has a relationship with their audience that they can then influence in a way that is authentic in a way that drives engagement with the brand right and mm -hmm. So don't think that it's all about numbers or all about creating viral content. Most times what a brand needs, there are very many different needs that a brand could have. Sometimes they just want the name out there. They just want people saying, oh, that is Leafy Suburb as a brand, you know, and Leafy Suburb is on everybody's lips and it's trending so that people have that in their minds. And then now these influencers who will then come and reinforce that and then say, this is what Leafy Suburb is. In fact, when I used Leafy Suburb, you know, yes. and then there's, interest and there's information that is being shared. And then these other influencers with their small microcosm of followers will then reinforce that and show 
how okay so this leafy suburb guys is actually quite great can you imagine right. this is this is how i use this and it changed my life in this way and i swear by it and so those are different tiers and different needs that are being met for a brand or for whatever product so it doesn't all look the same so you have to sort of just identify who you want to be when it comes to leading thoughts and opinions in whatever scope you're in and then sort of building that with consistency with quality content because also people think it's very easy but you know if i i can kind of give myself some some room to breathe so if i'm not as consistent with my content it's because i'm doing the other things that i do right and i'm not yes. primarily on these platforms i'm not primarily a youtuber i'm not primarily an instagrammer or somebody on twitter primarily the things that i do are offline you know as a singer as a performer as an actress music director hosting events those are all offline and social media for me is something that allows those things to to thrive in a bigger way mm-hmm. but if you want to come onto the platforms and you you want to be a content creator then you have to be consistent you have to constantly learn how to make your content um better better quality more engaging you have to figure out what the best times for you to post are or what your audience responds to and then you know uh, think about that while still honoring who you are as a creator yes. being honest and you know maintaining your credibility and authenticity and honoring yourself so that you don't find yourself just creating content because so and so created that content and it did well so i have to do the same no there's room mm-hmm. for everybody like everyone can be unique in their own way you we get to see new content creators coming up every day who are different from other content creators and who thrive because you know whether it's humor that they're tapping into whether it's relatability that they're tapping into honesty authenticity whether it's just touching stories like you know if you read this person's post every single day you will cry tears because emotion and then someone else will just back yeah. you up because they'll remind you of like funny yeah go you know so different people can tap into different things and there's room for everyone yeah that's really great to hear and there are a number of questions actually for you but we're mm-hmm. going to jump over to poji and then come back to talk to you again during our q and a mm-hmm. um so we can ask you all those all those questions that people have for you okay. thanks for taking the time to give us a snippet into your world we're truly grateful and we'll come back to you um when we're done we're talking with mr gashui aka oh. poji who has not unmuted himself and now he has karibu poji asante sana how are you good thank you what is your actual mpesa name These are the ones, all of them. Send them Pesa, <laughs> then we see. I'm sure I can post them out. Q&A. 10 Bob, 10 Thank you, you so much for joining us. You can this monetize episode. this webinar. <laughs> you can monetize this webinar. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, Poji. For having me. Thank you for having me. Um, you wear so many different hats. but of course the work that we're talking about today is to do with distribution and monetization which you sit squarely at with your work at MOOC um specifically so i think um a lot of our attendees will know that MOOC is 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 a social commerce platform where it's i think mostly known started off as ticketing and then grew off into other things including music um very popular choice to buy sort of event tickets from quite a seamless operation that happens in that process. So could you please talk to us a little bit about MOOC and its um its beginnings and where it came from and what the need for it was and what kind of content people are buying from it. Okay. Um I think that's a great place to start. Um I'll say I think me and Wilfred read from the same um and script in the same book cuz i like when he said some of the solutions that are going to fix the problems we have can't come from out there um we're going to have to build those locally and start to rethink the solutions locally right um, so actually i um, my background is in management and i've worked a lot with talent and so i have been exposed to the event and music scene for a couple of years mm-hmm. um, but what happened in around 2013 is that my business my current business partner Eric Thimba and I started trying to explore new avenues to make money and 
if you think about 2013, um, Safaricom was ripe. There's a lot of activity with M-Pesa. There's um, data is becoming faster and cheaper. And so for us, it was like, this is a great business opportunity to go online and just start to make some money from this online and convert some of the hassles. To mm. And we thought because of how M-Pesa was growing and all these things that it would be the easiest thing we ever did, start an online hustle. <laughs> and trying to start to sell a product. At that point, we were trying to sell uh, a women's heat patch, actually. And that's a story for another day. But we, we had a product we were trying to sell and it was very, very difficult to do it online. We knew a lot of the, the consumers who we were targeting. We knew they were on Facebook, but we'd go on Facebook and then they'd say, okay, how do I pay? Then do you send them your phone number? How right. do we do that interaction? When the Boda Boda guy comes, does he call you? Does he call me? And so because we were very interested in the efficiency of the process, we started trying to look for systems that could help us do that. And everything we found had one piece, but not the other. It mm -hmm. had a shop, but not payments. So it had payments, but it didn't allow you to connect to um, your, your existing audiences. And so we eventually sat with some developers and the solution we were trying to build for ourselves is what then became this um, solution that people now use across the markets, um, which is called MOOC. And it's mostly because how much work it took us to build the payments and the infrastructure, it made more sense to open it up than to keep it as a closed product. And so this is something we developed five years ago. And the big idea was to monetize mm -hmm. the audience online. Um, one of the things you'll find if you look at Patricia and, and she can, she's given us a good breakdown of the micros and the nanos. Mm -hmm. We spent the last 10, 15 years in the age of social media building followers and building fans. And for me, I think the conversion for monetization ha uh, happens when we can turn these fans to consumers, right? And that's part of what the influencer has helped a lot of brands to do where you can take your existing fans and because you know you share certain likes or preferences um, because you live in the same area or you live in similar neighborhoods, you're able to influence them to convert and consume certain products or services. And that conversion of fans to consumers became then the first thing we were trying to do in 2015 when we launched our platform. Now, the two things that we found from research that people were looking for was tickets to events mm -hmm. and especially based on the audience we're looking at, because a lot of people build tech for the now consumer, but tech is a very future, uh, future seeing kind of thing. Right. And so for us, it was always, what are the things that the young guys, the 18 year olds, the 15 year olds, the 22 year olds are looking for online? And how do we make those a little more accessible? And that's kind of how we segued into ticketing, how we started with music. And the demand obviously has grown, especially now in the pandemic and going forward. But those two at the time were the um, easiest kind of like clinchers in terms of merchants who had huge audiences already existing online. And that was the thing we wanted to convert. We wanted to take your existing audience and help you monetize them. Now the concept of monetizing for brands and all that has come from social media. But for us, we were thinking of um, the person who makes the teas. Now you have people who do paintings, who have photography. Um, you have guys who are making hats, who are printing t-shirts. How do you get all these people to be able to use their online audience to convert? And when uh, Wilfred talked about working backwards, it's an idea I really like where we've bought into this hype about a million followers or a hundred thousand views or a right. thousand likes. But even if they were worth a bob each, you don't need that hundred thousand bob to create this post. So what's the thing you need? And when you start to think of monetizing, how many people do you need buying your stuff for it to be financially viable for you to keep creating? And mm -hmm. so I was just accumulating the fans and the numbers of people who are coming and clicking if people were to buy and you made a commission, how many of those people do you need to get to your $5,000 or to your $10,000? So for us, MOOC, uh, MOOC is actually short for Mukwanja, which is a Sheng word for money. And, I didn't uh, know that. I didn't know that that was 
Das wurde schon vor. MOOC means money. And so for us, a key part of it was how do we monetize our existing audience? And that's kind of how we began. And the, the diversity of the merchants we serve is based on that. Who are the people who have great online audiences who can, they can quickly convert to consumers? And how can we help them make that easy and efficient for both them and their consumers? Ah, it, it also now makes sense what, that your tagline is making commerce social. It's all kind of tying in together. Um, and based on that and, and this kind of move that you've made from, from not just being about um, music and ticketing for events to other spheres, what would you say are the emerging trends you're seeing as MOOC in terms of what people are buying? And especially in this period, this 2020. Mm. I think one, one of the big things I can give you guys a quick, like, you know, cheat over here or in on something, we might need to change our tagline from making commerce social and change it to discover Africa. Mm. And, and the reason for this is even for us, when we look at our merchant backend and we see the, the breadth of people who are there, there's things I didn't think about. I've spoken to the leader of an SDA church um, somewhere who has 10 choirs and all of them have albums they've created and they have communities around the SDA church globally who are looking to consume this music but don't have a way to, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I've spoken to um, producers, music producers in Tanzania, right? Um, who are now working cross-border because there's also a lot of collaboration when you move younger in the audiences. So you have a producer who is based in Tanzania, who has an artist in the UK and an artist in Kenya and an artist in Rwanda. They're all working together. They're all looking for one platform to monetize collectively. How can they split their money on one platform? How can they all view reports on one platform? So when you start to speak to these people, you realize, and, and one of the things when Patricia was talking about um, honoring yourself, I, I'd call it crafting your space because there's a lot of people like you. Um, and now with COVID, what we've realized is the world is flat. With this global playground, you can connect across the globe um, as long as you work out time zones and where to do your boosts and that you can connect with audiences from anywhere. Right. So for us, it's been, what are the things you like? For Patricia, some, one day it will be comedy, another day it will be music, another day it's a movie she's in, another day it's, and connecting to all those multiple audiences is the same way we all are. Today I'm listening to music and then in the afternoon I wanna go watch a play or I wanna go watch a movie. And how do we satisfy that consumer need through all the stuff that we have? Because there's so much that we are creating, which is why we want to move to discover, discover Africa, because right. there's so much out there. You don't even know what you're looking for yet until you start scrolling. Then you're like, oh, wow, I didn't know we had um, improv comedy shows. I didn't know we had book launches. I didn't know we had um, dress up galas. And so because of just scrolling through, you're able to discover so much of what the continent has to offer. And then for us, what scaling out has taught us is that when you go into Uganda, when you go into Rwanda, you're finding similar pockets of creatives, but also audiences. So mm -hmm. when I go there, I immediately see an audience, which I'm like, these guys would buy tickets to BYSS any minute because they would com completely connect to that idea. And so now what the internet has given us the opportunity to do is let's turn this creative craft we have into content and let's open it up for people to do the same $5 or $3 that they've been subscribing to international platforms. They can yeah. give it to us and we can split it in a more creator friendly way because um, I saw a question in the chat from, I think it was Leon who was saying, what, what's, how do we get the audiences to move into this local platforms considering yes. there's a, such a huge audience in the international world? And there's actually not a huge audience. The, the way Spotify and Apple Music and YouTube treat, treat African creators, you can tell they don't have 10 million subscribers from here. They have maybe 100,000, maybe a million. 
If you look at African content, we're hitting a million, two million, but we have 49 million people in Kenya alone. Mm. If 50% of those are youth, it means you as a creator have access to 25 million Kenyans who can easily relate to what you're going through because they live in the exact same situation you do. So for me, if then we directed the 25 million people to a more affordable platform than $3 a month that they can pay for, I'm sure they'd be willing to. Right. People who will stop a Patricia or a BN or somebody on the streets and be like, hey, Napenda Gomazako, I want to take a picture, a selfie. Those people exist countrywide. And because we are in this bubble, we've lived in a good world. Pre COVID, I think things came to us so much, we didn't do too much exploring. But now, mm. if we go out to discover the audiences and to try to connect authentically with the audiences, there's so much in Africa, especially when we look at young people and creative stuff, music, theater, comedy, um, arts and digital arts, you're looking at um, this VR, like there's so much that's being created yes. in Africa that we haven't even scratched the surface yet and we're transacting a million dollars. So I think the next three years could see us do Facebook type of numbers or YouTube right. type of numbers right. because now the demand from the telcos or the services and everyone to bring data costs down because people are home. They can see what people are consuming. They are interested in getting people consuming more. And so I think there's a huge opportunity where we are now to like multiply what the Patricias and them have started already in right. terms of creating right. a market. There's an opportunity now for us to spread that starting from a smaller community Patricia will tell us what that's called, nano, or whatever. <laughs> nano micro. One. Whatever, <laughs> one with your 15 followers. If you and your 15 followers and you can move 15 people from this to this venue, or you can move 15 people to switch from drinking coffee to a different kind of tea, what that already is the influence we are looking for. And then you move those 15 to 150, and then you move that to a million people, and you just yes. keep growing that organically. Um, and now is the time, I think. I agree with you, Poji. And thank you so much for that overview because it just, it covers so many um, things that I think a lot of people have a lot of questions about. Yeah. Um, and going back to what you were saying about when, in the beginning, when you were setting off, I remember it was around the time that a lot of us in the sector were also lamenting this whole idea of, you know, Silicon Savannah, there's all this buzz and PESA, FinTech, all these areas are growing, but I don't think that at the time we were seeing a translation into the creative sector. Mm. We're not seeing the same kind of like solutions happening at the same pace. So from that scenario, Poji, to one where you are transacting over a hundred million shillings a year, because mm. I think that's what a million dollars translates to, what do you see as kind of future scenarios? Because you've talked about Facebook numbers, um, what's ideal for MOOC and for e-commerce and social commerce specifically going forward? I think um, number one, we, the creative sector before today, I think now because we've all gotten into this situation where we are at home and we are having to look at all kinds of um, scenarios and situations, the creative sector has kind of come up in the conversation quite a bit from the beginning of the year to now, but there's been very little support, funding, any of that that goes towards specifically the creative sectors. Um, why? I would think it's because a lot of the people who have been putting in money have been putting in money for immediate return. And the creative sector here is driven by young people. And the young people are many. Our mean age is about 19.5, which means when you look at banks, when you look at all those people, we're not in their, we're not in their books yet. We're mm -hmm. not a valuable consumer at 19.5. But if we look five years from now or 10 years from now, those 19 years olds are the ones who will be 30 years old. They will be the maximum consumer they'll be the biggest consumer globally in terms of um, content in terms of like, that's the next consumer. America has saturated its audience. Europe has saturated its audience. So as they're moving here, um, I think there's a huge opportunity. I don't know yet whether 
our governments and our corporates have seen the shift. Mm -hmm. And I think it doesn't matter. Um, my thought is that the brands need the content creators and the influencers more than the influencers need the brands. And so if there's ways that we can be able to finance or create um, models that can monetize the kind of content that we want to create as opposed to creating for brands, um, there's a huge opportunity for the kind of stories we can tell. There's a huge opportunity for the kind of value we can build. There's a huge, I mean, Nairobi is as metropolitan as it comes. So even our exposure growing up and the kind of things we're used to, we are French speaking people here. We have, like we're exposed to so much that we can build things in scenarios that um, are not imaginable in other continents or in other regions. And so, I think the time is now. I think the, the craft is going to be respected a lot more in terms of creatives and creatives is broad. We have guys writing books. And if you look at how many books have come out in the last year, you yes. start to appreciate that <laughs> it's actually even a reading culture, which everybody said was dead. So if you yes. go books, theater, music, um, art, there's so much that we can grow. And it starts with appreciating the value it has. And I think that's where this conversation comes. What is the value? What are the mm. numbers? And for me, the numbers start with even just locally. Um, I like when Wilfred said we have 50 cinemas and 50 million people. There's no way we can send all the guys to cinemas. So what's the new way to get content to these people directly? And mm -hmm. that's what Kenyans are known for. We are the innovators for Africa. <laughs> we are. This is and, our time to collectively innovate and create what that solution looks like. Thanks, Boji. I think actually this would be a really good point at which to open up this discussion mm -hmm. to the floor so we can go into a Q&A and to borrow from what you were just talking about and the question from Leon Omondi via Facebook for you, Wilfred. Um, just based on what you were just saying right now, Koji, about numbers, about platforms. Leon was asking um, Wilfred that since international services, you know, global ones, you've got your Netflix and the rest of them are so easily accessible, how do you incentivize um, our domestic market to access the kind of content that you have up on places like Boomi Central, so local platforms? Yeah. So the thing about um, audiences being able to access the, the content locally is, is, is that it's not available anywhere else. So, you know, a good, a good example is Softy. It's not yet available on Netflix or any other place. So the only choice they have is really to go to a cinema or Google Center. And why so even in terms of marketing, I think that's the best marketing tool for us when people discover content and they discover the platform that they, you know, they can watch, watch it on. Then there as well, they will start discovering the other, um, you know, content that is similar. And, and mm -hmm. the whole idea is also curation. You know, when you create content that is biased towards Africa, then you have no choice knowing that, you know, but to you know that there's a place where you belong. Um, if you take your, you know, content to Amazon, it's, a, it's an ocean, you know, once you drop it there, it's really people will might discover it if more people watch it because their organic films then work that way. But if you don't push, you don't do a marketing campaign, no one will ever discover your content there and it will be there five years not making anything. Okay, okay. Thank you, Wilfred. Um, that I'll take another question from the floor. This one's from Nyambura Kitongo for you, Patricia Kihoro. Come back, Oji. <laughs> Um, Patricia Nyambura is asking, um, in the event of a dispute with a client, mm -hmm. what mechanisms exist to protect you as the influencer or content creator? Yeah. And do you feel that your work and ideas are safe in that context, so to speak? So let me, let me answer from the back about ideas and content being safe. Um, one of the things I've, I've come to learn and sort of start to put my foot down on is this this thing where brands will reach out to you and then ask you for a content proposal, right? So mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of like pitching for ad agencies where they want you to, you know, ideate, come up with this concept for their product or service or what, whatever, do the ideas, break it down, how you will post, what the ideas will be about, what you will talk about. So you're already doing work, right? Yeah. I, 
feel like they've gotten to a point where they don't really value the ideation process of a concept, right? So they will have you do that work, have you submit the proposal, and then tell you, we'll let you know if we'll go with you. So you've already spent hours, right? Man hours creating this idea, which is where most of the work is. Creating the content and posting is sort of part two and part three. And part two is, you know, creating the content is also, you know, it can be difficult, but part three, which is just publishing, publishing the post is the simplest. All you have to do is press a button. But right. a lot, I feel like a lot of people still feel like no posting is the work. So they'll tell you, no, just do the, just do, we'll let you know when to post. We'll let you know when we'll approve. We'll let you know when you can go ahead. And I've gotten to a point where, you know, sometimes you'll see your idea, they'll tell you, oh, we, we opted to go with somebody else. And then you see somebody else executing your ideas. Because you did the ideation. Because you did the ideation. And concept development. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's a thing because influencer marketing and content creation is such a new thing that we're all sort of trying to figure out and craft what the systems look like or, you know, what the guidelines should be. It's something that for me, I've had to get to a point where I'm like, you know what, this doesn't work for me. This, this thing of slaving through the night, burning the midnight oil to come up with a proposal that may or may not be approved doesn't work for me no mm. so if you want me to ideate something for you you will either pay a deposit right or you will send me a contract where you're guaranteeing me this work because the reason you came to me in the first place is because you like my work and you can see how i work you ask me for a profile for a rate card I, i'll give you all those things there's links to my work you can see right mm. there's no an audition and I was actually watching Aaron Rimbui's um, CTA episodes and today episode 22 he was talking about you know be, him as Aaron Rimbui who has played for years and years being asked to audition or to put together a proposal to book a space and in that space videos of his gigs are playing <laughs> so there's this thing there's this thing where not only do you not feel valued but they also, they'll, they'll try and do this thing where they diminish you so that you feel like you're desperate for this work. And while I have to say that it's such a privilege to get to do this work, which we love and enjoy and get paid for it, there has to be a mutual respect, right? And so I've gotten to a point now where if you ask me for a proposal, it's because you know of the kind of work that I will do. I'll give you a call and say, you know, I'm thinking maybe going in this direction. If you're cool with it, please send a contract through. And the contract, whether it's yours or whether it's mine, yeah, because I've also learned that I need to have my own contract that protects me because most brands, most corporations are protecting themselves. You know what I mean? So when they send you a contract, it's not so that you can also feel like you're protected. It is so that they can cover themselves so you have to learn that you, you know, create your own contract or have somebody on hand who can help you decipher a contract so that you know, one, if they're sending you an NDA, you can send them an NDA back where you say, fine, here's a proposal. We have this guarantee of we'll get to this point. But in the case that you do not use my, my proposal or my concept or my idea, you will never think about it again. Let me not see somebody trying to create or to do or to execute something of that sort. Um, two, you know, because it feels like for me, the ideation is the, is like 90% of the work that I do. It's the idea. It's the idea that, that, that brings your brand to life, you know, that, that costs money. Yes. And, and, and so you have to pay for that because it's almost like a consultation. It's a consultancy gig. You know, they're consulting with you to help them um, tell a story around their brand or their product. And Pretty that much. is something that they, sh they should value. And if you can pay an ad agency to come up with a concept, me, who is just little old me, Patricia, is doing the work that, you know, I'm thinking about this content, I'm shooting it myself, I'm editing it myself, I am scripting it myself, like everything that most content creators do, they do themselves. Mm. You know, it's something that they learn, they put in the hours to learn. When I was telling you that I can be up till three, four in the morning watching YouTube videos and tutorials because this, this world of creation fascinates me. As much as it's something that I love to do, I've learned also to attach value to it. It's almost like going to school. You know, 
yes, I'm yes. putting the hours to learn this thing and to make sure that I do the best of my ability to present your brand or product in the best light possible. And I know that when a brand associates with me, they're doing it so that they can legitimize themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And that is of value. So even me, I've had to give myself pep talks and be like, but Patricia, you are valuable. Like, <laughs> you know? um, and, so, and so in protecting yourself is also like now with the contract and um, having the law on your side and understanding that they can protect themselves and you can do the same as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that value, there's just one follow-up question um, for you, Patricia, from Ongere, mm -hmm. asking what are the tools that you use to track the audience reach of what you're doing, of your campaigns or the engagement? Right. So all these platforms that we're on, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, on the back end, they provide you with metrics that you can use to, as, to sort of just like evaluate your reach, your engagement, um, your impressions, all these platforms offer them. Um, before you used to have to like look for an app that will then tell you these are the impressions or websites that did that. But um, over the years, the actual apps themselves, the platforms themselves have incorporated them. So usually when we're doing our reports as content creators, we just go to the back end of Instagram and it gives you all the metrics. It will tell you this number of people from this country, Azerbaijan, uh, <laughs> you have 14 people who view this content. So it's very, it's very, they break it down, even to people who save your content. How many people shared it? How many people replied to it? All these metrics are provided by the platforms that we're on. So you don't really need to look for anything external. They're provided. Even YouTube, it's just so broken down. I still discover metrics today that I didn't know YouTube is offering me. And I'm like, oh, so you are telling me, you can tell me the language this person who come, like, it's, mm. the, provide them, yes, yeah. Okay, Asante, Patricia, parting yeah. shot from Patricia? I, I had to do that. A parting shot, I think I would say, I mean, I see some questions here, but I mean, you can definitely reach out to me and I'll speak to you about that. But I would say that the influencer space, a lot of people will say, oh, but it feels so saturated and there's too many people. It's not. Every voice is valid. Every single voice is valid. If you decide today, Podgy, that you want to be a YouTube star, you can do it. You know, Washuka, if you decide today that you just want to get onto Instagram or TikTok, me, TikTok, I've tried, I can't. I it's actually too much work because I, I look at the content all of you post and it's a lot of work. I have accepted I it. I am, I am leaving the bracket of youth in a month. So <laughs> I have accepted. I turned 35 in, a, in exactly a month. So it's okay. TikTok in Manishinda. But you can find, even if it's one platform, because also you don't need to be on all. Don't think that because now you want to start a YouTube channel. So now I have to start an Instagram page and Facebook. And no, you can pick one. You can use your voice and please believe that your voice is valid. Whatever you have to share is valid and there will be people to consume it. And if you want to do this in an intentional way, just know that consistency, quality, and authenticity are the things that you need and you can grow as long as you also remember the purpose, why you're there in the first place. If you're there to make money, it's fine. Whatever purpose you have is also valid. If you're there because you want to serve others, fine. If you want to share information, fine. As long as you, you, you remember what your purpose is in the moments of doubt, because that's the thing that will keep you going. Thank you, Patricia. Poji, have you given up on TikTok? I didn't even start. This is how I know that my my bracket exit was not has... that necessary. <laughs> yeah, I only watch I watch what people have sent to me already. Right. And the best of TikTok is what I consume. Your uh, mm -hmm. the platform MOOC. Yes. And commerce and it being social, mm -hmm. and the realities of this year and how so many more people are doing things online that they didn't even imagine actually um, that they would ever do online, right? What, what has 2020 looked like for social commerce and what are you predicting going forward? What's the biggest thing you've learned also during this downtime in terms of your business model? It's a good question actually. Um, 
Well, I would say this. When we began in 2015, we were going around preaching to everybody about this digital migration. Um, build your audience online. Start to do transactions online. Use that data to be able to build a transaction history and go to banks and go to these people. But we were preaching. Nothing. Everybody was like, oh, it sounds good, but I already have this shop. I'm already working with so-and-so. I already have this campaign. And what this year has done is that it's made the kind of tech and the kind of things that we've been preaching a necessity now. It's no longer a nice to have. Um, if you don't have a digital presence, if you don't understand your audience, um, if you're not able to transact offline, uh, and when I say offline, I mean out of your shop and now in the spheres of people are not coming to the mall, you will not survive. And so there's a lot of drive towards digital the problem is it's, it's new waters. Um, it's not the same land people are used to. It's very expensive to navigate. There's a lot of sharks. There's a lot of competition. If you don't know what you're doing, you could lose a lot of money. And so I think the biggest opportunity that we have at the position where we are is that the last five years have been a great foundation, but we are able to now lead thousands more businesses to the online space. Um, we understand some of the needs. This year has taught us that you could build your event empire for life and then one day events are pulled off in two days and you have to start to rethink. So sitting with the developers, sitting with the organizers, sitting with the musicians, there's a lot of rethinking um, that has had to happen. Mm -hmm. And that thinking is going to be long term. I think the innovations that come will be great. But we're moving into a time now where we can build together, um, starting to erase some of the, 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 the numbers we know. So I have, I'm of this belief that the numbers we've been taught to look at are all lies. Mm. So forget about your million followers, forget about the 10,000 likes and start to see how many of this do I actually convert? Is it 1%, is it 2%, is it 5%? And then start to grow that number. If you have 50 people, if you are 100 people, that's enough for you to make your rent every month. If you can collect two bob, five bob, 10 bob a day or a week, you can make this money. So I think um, it's going to call for us to first look inwards a lot. We're going to start to respect the opportunity that exists throughout our country. So we're going to see Patricia influencing some hotel in Kitale somewhere and some influencer from somewhere in Mars a bit becoming big. We're gonna to start to see our world expanding a little bit more than we're used to, um, but it's all for the better. We've had a great head start, especially as, as Kenya and as the kind of youth and the education and the facilities that are available, the schools, the training. So I think training more young people, creating more informed um, creatives, making sure they know what's happening, making sure they have the back end support in terms of accounting and legal and copyrights, because all these things come, once you start to make money, if you didn't um, get the right copyrights, all that money will disappear. So this back end information that needs to all come together. And I think because we've had time to sit back and slow down our pace and realize what is valuable and what we have in our hands, um, the next three, four years is going to be transformative for the creative sector. And I think tech plays a very big role. Education plays a very big role. And so putting all these things together and, and collaborating to create the ecosystems that we need between us and the creators. So I can't just create a thing to compete with YouTube. I need to sit with Patricia and say, based on the kind of money you're currently making, if you were to have a platform that worked better for you, what would that look like? What would that, what would you need? Do you need reports? Do you need money directly in your Mpesa? Do you need something that can help you access loans to be able to buy equipment or to be able to hire a team? So what are the things that these platforms need to provide for the creatives and how do we build that so that then that makes us more competitive than these other existing platforms? But um, the opportunity is great and, and collaboration has to be a big part of it. So don't look at us and compare us to, hey, how come you don't give me this like iTunes, but how do we build that thing together so that four or five years from now, the creators are able to benefit immensely from the solutions we have locally. 
Okay. Thank you, Poji. Um, a kind of final, final follow up to that, just based on what you've just shared. Are you finding joy with local investment? Not really. Um, and so what has actually happened is in, in our quest to find investment for ourselves, we've had to um, look at slightly larger opportunities to be able to find investment, not just for ourselves, but also for the merchants who trade through us. Because okay. we realize that it's not a problem we are going through. Even if I got money and I can start running, the event organizers have had eight months of a slump. The artists haven't done shows. Um, some of the other creatives who use the platform haven't had business for eight months. So how do we restart as a collective? And I mean, one of the benefits we have is that online gives us a lot of data. So using that data, we're trying to make this creative economy. And I'm going to shout out the team at Hiva because we're working very closely with them to build mm -hmm. something specifically for creatives around investment and being able to access money based on your transactions online. So the opportunity is there, but it's not, it's not been a, an easy road to find money for creatives and for creative platforms, um, but that hopefully is gonna change. We're still waiting Fantastic. for a amen moment of 2020, it's coming. It we have come. a couple more days. Come. Yeah, yeah, it's coming. It will come. Thank you so much, Poji. Um, and thanks for letting us know about a potential collaboration with, with Hiva Fund, who of course do really fantastic work um, in, in kind of, you know, making financing in our sector accessible in very many forms. Right. Wilfred. Yes. Parting shot and also question. <laughs> I'm a filmmaker. I brought you a wonderful film. Um, it's a documentary. How much of what you're making in terms of percentage am I taking home? Okay, so um, so it really depends on um, you know in terms of uh, uh, the percentages that we agree on because we are currently with what at, at premium stage we are almost like replacing the theatre. So if we put in the marketing budget ourselves, then it's at a 50-50 revenue share. Okay. okay. If you're also doing the pushing, then you can negotiate on the, on, on the percentages. But uh, as I said, it's completely up to you, the vendor, to decide. Um, and it's also non-exclusive. You can decide to you know, um, publish it on five different platforms. Right. So it really depends up to you. Yeah. So I can be, I'm on Netflix, I'm on Showmax, I'm on Boomi Central, I can be... Okay, okay. Yeah. But you know, at, at the premium uh, premium window, it's, it, you know, basically the way it works out is you, you have windows. So you have the article, um, you have t -Bot, and then you have uh, either ad-driven or um, s -Bot. s -Bot is where Netflix is. So of course, once you go down one tire, it's very hard to come back up one tire. So it's like you can't come from Netflix to theater. So you really have to be careful how do you decide to um, um, distribute your film or how you want to release your film. Okay, okay. Well, all the best with the platform. I'm sure it's going Thank to you. grow exponentially. It's only been a few months and I'm sure you're all learning quite a lot. Um, everyone check them out online. And Asante Sana Poji for joining Thank us for this conversation. Thank you so much, Wilfred. Thank you so you're much, Patrick. I know we're slightly over time. I apologize about that. And Judy Ogana will come back on now to close this conversation. Thank you so much to all three panelists for taking the time to share everything about what you're doing with us. That was a really lovely conversation for me to have and I've learned an incredible amount of information actually during this, this session. Asante Nisana. Over to you Judy. Thank you. And yeah, what a rich conversation we've had. Um, I think we can all agree that we've learned a lot. So as we wrap up this session and on behalf of all the partners, we would obviously like to really thank our panelists, um, Roger Rosso, Patricia Kahoro and Wilfred Kumu, Kumi for their insightful, inspiring contribution in the digital space. Um, the opportunities, the challenges that they go through, um, and also for being very candid and open with us about their process. We've heard about uh, market strategies and positioning, the value of being an early adopter. I have not heard of, what was that? Web, Webfluencer, uh, this is the first time I'm hearing about it. Um, the importance of building partnerships with clients 
I think that's um, in on all levels, it's really important. Uh, um, I, I liked what uh, Patricia was saying about finding your unique sweet spot and what uh, Mook was talking, I was saying about crafting your own space um, and turning your fans into consumers. I mean, a, a resource already right there that you can be able to turn around and monetize from them. Um, the value of innovation and new ways of getting content directly to customers is, has obviously come out as an important aspect of this. Um, and um, I think uh, we touched on uh, the securing your content and ideas. And that as, is a big issue, I think, especially with the creative industries and the creative sector. So how we can crack how to secure our ideas because that's where our creativity is, is really critical and important. Um, and, and, so, and so many other things, I'm, I'm so happy to know what MOOC actually stands for or, or means. <laughs> MOOC Kwanja, did you say? Um, so we've learned so much and and we can't uh, really thank um, our panelists enough for, for, for their insightful and um, interesting uh, take on, on, on what they're doing and what they're, um, what they're Oh dear, I think we lost Judy. Poleni Sana, I think that's Thursday saying that it is time. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you everyone for coming to this conversation. Um, and it will be posted on the Alliance Francaise YouTube page um, if you want to go back and, and maybe listen back to, to some things wait, that wait, are. Can, I, can you hear me now? I just want yes. to quickly thank Ashuka. Thank you. So bomb, so wonderful, so wonderful, so great. <laughs> you can see Patricia's improv skills coming to use. Right? Use this is the right <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I got off offline somehow, oh. but uh, Asanteni oh. Sana. Thank you. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much for having us. Bye. 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 Yeah. Yeah, thank you.